don't move information to authority, move the authority to the information. We have to get all, all that is needed on the front line so they can make competent decisions and be competent and competent and committed to do what they need to do. Right. So there's always this mentality of like, Hey, give me the information so I can make the decision and tell you what to do. It's just continually pushing out the, the Intel of what the frontline worker needs. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the H3X podcast with your hosts, uh, Dave Miller and Mark Gearing, and today we are joined by none other than Carter Cox, who happens to be hanging out in New York with Mark and his family, and also Kyle Pearson from the Metro of DFW. What's up, guys? Thanks for joining us this morning. What's up? Good to be here. So Kyle and I have been kicking around this book that he uh, told me over lunch I needed to read, and so I went home and got it, read the book, and I was like, no wonder Kyle thought we wanted to read it. It's called Turn This Ship Around, and uh, it's been a really influential book for Kyle. So I said, hey, why don't you hop on and let's talk about some of the lessons that you've learned from that book. Um, that's the story of a Navy captain of a submarine that took the worst submarine in the entire fleet and turned it around to the best submarine in the entire fleet and how he accomplished that. And there's some golden nuggets uh, that were in that book. And I understood after I read it, why Kyle uh, had us read it. So Kyle, you get, you get to kick us off and you get to tell us why does turn this ship around, um, seem so important to you, especially when it comes to developing leaders. He takes this ship, as you said, that's the least performing Navy, uh, submarine into the best performing submarine in a very short amount of time. And he basically shifts from this leader follower mentality to a leader leader mentality. And that is all about, <clears throat> that's what we're all about. We're all about raising up leaders. And um, it's, it's really just distributing or, or pushing out leadership, just handing it, handing it over and trusting those that are, taking ownership with with the tasks that they've they've been given that's really the short of it and so he talks about how i mean the morale was so low because of this leader leader mentality you can't do anything until i've told you to do it type leadership to hey i trust you with the tasks that you've been given i trust you with the skills that you have and the knowledge that you have and that just built the morale of the ship and made it a ton more efficient, and the trust level went through the roof uh, among among all the, you know, among, among all the shipment. So it was just uh, just another another book that emphasizes decentralized leadership and trusting people with the skills and tasks that they've been given. You know, of course, with the Navy. In the uh, context of the Navy, I mean, there's some oversight. There's a lot of accountability. Um, <clears throat> in our context, I mean, we're not hiring people or holding them accountable like the Navy would hold people accountable. But the principles still apply as we're trying to see a task accomplished. I think one of my favorite stories from the book, um, as I was reading through it, was the one whenever he was uh, giving orders and he was testing his crew. And he went back and told him to switch to the electric motor uh, and to take it off of the nuclear power. And then he told him, full ahead, two thirds, right? And uh, everybody was like, uh, whatever. Well, how do they say it on a, on a, on a submarine? He gives, the, he gives the command. He says, yeah. you know, two thirds. And the, the, the person bought, you know, the person that he commanded said, said do it two thirds. And they didn't do it. And then they're like, why did you do it? He said, because. There's no such thing as a two thirds. Uh, right. He told him he's on the electric motor. The two thirds doesn't exist. It, it can't go that fast. And then he asked the question, then why did you pass on the order if you knew that the order wasn't even possible with the mechanics of the ship? And he said, well, because you told me to. And that's whenever he said he realized, OK, something drastic has to change here because they were just taught to just do whatever they were told that the captain was whatever he says goes, even if what he said wasn't even possible, they were just like, do it anyway. 
And then that was kind of like a break, a, a moment for him where he's like, okay, we got to do something different with this and give them ownership and responsibilities over their areas to lead. Yeah. I think one of the, the my favorite quotes in the book is if you, if you give control, you create leaders. But if you take control, then you attract followers. So that to me that's is, good. that's money. Good. Yeah. And that's, <clears throat> that's our work, man. We want to, we want to give control to people that, I mean, we like we have any control, but you know, we want to empower. And I love how he uses the word emancipate in the book. He doesn't say empower. He says emancipate, like free people up to do what they've already been tasked to do with the skills that they have. So my uh, suggestion, or this is my thought, instead of saying release the priesthood, I think we should say emancipate the priesthood. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. The, the like fear for us would be like, oh, we don't want to give control to the, the people and they don't do it the right way or it doesn't it doesn't like translate to like we lose we lose momentum we don't move towards the vision whatever how, like so how did they do that how did they create that culture the they shifted the culture by uh the fo the focus being on uh or shifting it from not making mistakes to uh achieving excellence so that's that was the shift that they they began to talk differently, uh, they began to use different vernacular, and so there was just this, you know, overwhelming fear of like I don't want to make a mistake, so I'm going to wait to do what do what I'm told told instead of achieving this this excellence in um, <clears throat> in their work. So they were just totally changing their motivation. Uh, that was one. That was one way. Um, you know, giving ownership was also uh, another one. Just implementing and actually giving that ownership to people to do uh, do the tasks that they've been given, and uh, you know, just honestly changing their behavior. You know, uh, one of the quotes says that they change their behavior in hopes that this leads to new thinking. So they began to talk differently on the ship. They used to talk, di they talked differently about the ship. So, um, yeah, it was, uh, it, it, he talks about how it wasn't a smooth transition. I mean, there was a lots of stuff in their toes and things like that. But, um, man, it was just, it, you know, we love, yeah, in no place left, we love military books because, I mean, we're in a war, <laughs> you know, and it's, and it's a complex war. And um, we can learn a lot from, from from books like this and from leaders like this. There's two things that really stuck out to me, Mark, as far as the process as well, that um, he was, uh, that Kyle was just alluding to. And one of them was that some of the hiccups that they had was those guys had to be trained to know their role. And they had to be really, really good at it in order to be empowered on what they're going to do. In other words, if he was going to say, I'm going to empower the uh, engineer room back there where the engines are running, and I'm going to empower him to make the right decisions and to give me the information that I need, then he needs to not sort of understand his job. He needs to be the absolute expert mm -hmm. of that job on the ship so that the information that he's giving me. And so what they found was, is that in the empowering process, it started to weed out to people um, who weren't willing to own it to such a degree that they could lead in it. And so it actually started kind of making a difference in who started to gain rank, who started to grow, who started to change, who started to be challenged. And I think one of the cool things was, is that as you got towards the end of the book, not only did he turn the ship around, but there were, I don't remember exactly what the statistics were, Kyle, but they had more captains that came out of the Santa Fe than any other nuclear submarine in the Navy's fleet because of the culture that was created where these guys were learning how to make snap decisions, hard decisions, to learn the ship, to learn their roles, uh, to learn those things. And so that was a real huge takeaway for me is, is that if we're going to empower people, we also have to take the responsibility to make sure that we train those people we empower because if they're not, like we say in MPL all the time, if they're not confident and competent, right. they're not going to take ownership and to empower somebody, 
and then not give them the tools and the training that they need to go and do what you're asking them to do is a bigger frustration than just telling them what to do all the time. There's like the, there's a shift on both ends. Like the primary leader had to shift from command and control, but then also leaders, leadership's getting redefined. And so the kind of leaders that you are looking for begin to change and emerge. And then uh, that empowering raised up leaders. The uh, other side of that as well is, is that when you have people who aren't interested in this type of uh, environment, getting them to self-lead is a bottomless pit. The nice thing about a submarine is, is that you're on it for a long time. You've got a specific job. You have to do your job and it is high accountability and high um, uh, consequence, right? And so when you put those two together, it caused the crucible effect to really rise to the surface because if they didn't really know their job, there was a significant consequence if they didn't do what they were asked to do or know how to do what they were asked to do. And I think sometimes in our environment, one of the hardest things to create it is, a, is that environment of high accountability and high consequence because it's easy sometimes in a volunteer. Of course, everybody's a volunteer, even in business with a job, even on the submarine everybody is a volunteer they're deciding to give of their time even if they're paid to do it someone may voluntold them to leave but they're still a volunteer at heart um and so sometimes when people bow out it makes it harder so my biggest i think question that i had was how do we create that environment that gives people the opportunity to be empowered but also holds them accountable so where they take the responsibility and the consequences because if that environment starts to happen in the in the church planning, church reproduction networks, then we start cooking with gas and creating leaders very quick. One of the things that they did, one of the mechanisms that they they implemented was they specified they specified goals and, and not uh, methods. So in their case, it was because the crew was motivated to devise to devise the best approach to doing what they had to do. Right. So. There's always two different, right? We love methodology and we see methodology is important to reproduce leaders um, and competent leaders at that. But they specified the goals and they trusted them to uh, come up with the best way possible to accomplish those goals. So that was part of that just releasing of, hey, look, look we, we feel that you're a competent person, you're smart, you're capable. Here's what we're trying to accomplish. Find the best way to do it. All right. And don't get don't get caught up in, well, you know, I didn't use this tool. Or I could, you know, I didn't have this conversation because I didn't have a piece of paper and I couldn't write out the three circles. You know, it's like, <clears throat> no, what's the best way to accomplish getting to the gospel? What's the best way of planting churches? What's the best way of, you know, whatever it is. So uh, that was awesome. Just providing the people the objectives. Right. And what is the best way? What's the best method? Figure it out, right? And they allowed them that that freedom on on the ship. And you know, Dave, you talk a lot about uh, clarity, and uh, they wanted uh, people at all levels of the organization uh, to completely understand what the organization was about. So just that clarity of like, what are we trying to do? You know, what what is what are we all here for, <laughs> right? And so that clarity. Um, led to that that competency, right? It led to that trust to see, you know, the ship turned around, right? So, man, so much great overlap. Love it, man. I was eating this stuff up. How long ago did you run into this book? Uh, I think it was maybe about six months ago. Yeah. Oh, no wonder you were so high on it. I thought you had read it a little bit further along than that. And I was like, man, I got it. I was like, this is a really good book. It's helpful. Yeah, uh, David Marquette is the author. If you're on LinkedIn, he's a great follow on LinkedIn because he just you know, drops some great bombs. You know, just some reminders. Another, you know, some, a couple of great quotes um, from, from the book. I love this quote. We've talked about this, but it says, don't move information to authority. Move the authority to the information. Right. So it's that, you know. Uh, hey, we have to get all all that is needed on the front line so they can make competent decisions and be competent and competent and committed to do what they need to do, right? So there's always this mentality of like, hey, give me the information so I can make the decision and tell you what to do. 
right? So it's just continually pushing out the the intel of what the frontline worker needs, you know, and that's uh, I love that, right? We're always trying to do that. Yeah, I love at the end of Acts thirteen the wording there how Luke records he in, entrusted these leaders that they appointed in all the churches that they started, he entrusted them to the Lord in whom they believed. Um, he didn't entrust them to Jerusalem. He didn't entrust them to Peter, James, and John. He didn't even entrust them to, you know, themselves, Paul and Barnabas. But, you know, that, that vision that, you know, you can hear from the Lord, you have the commands of Jesus not that it's not going to be messy, but we can trust the Lord. It's his mission. You're now one of his laborers. We can entrust you to this task and leave. Um, I think that would be something we could all say, whether it's a no place left or even in ministry before that, that we are all a product of someone who empowered us, gave us authority, whether it was to stand up and preach or lead a Bible study or take some type of responsibility that maybe we weren't really fully ready for, but because we did have the Lord and someone handed us the reins, we, we, we failed forward. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it sounds similar in this. And then I was also just thinking the importance of mauling, you know, model assist, watch launch. Like um, if, if, we, if what we are doing can't be modeled, so that it can, you know, we can assist someone else in it so that we can watch them do it and launch them into that role or task, then it's very hard to pass down skills and competencies to the front line uh, if I if the buck stops with me and whatever I'm doing. So mm -hmm. just the importance of of mall in in releasing that control down to the front line. Yeah. I, I, one of the best quotes I remember Steve Smith saying was, uh, you trust the Holy Spirit in you, but do you trust the Holy Spirit in others? <laughs> so, yeah, same Holy Spirit. And like my wife likes to say, the Holy Spirit in you is not, you know, forty-four, and the uh, Holy Spirit in that new believer is not two years old. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> you know? It's like same Spirit. That's do you right. trust God in them to accomplish the work that He has given them. I like this practical uh, quote from the, the book that I pulled up here. It says um, uh, a briefing. He said this is a, a phenomenon I've seen many times. A briefing is a passive activity for everyone except the briefer. And then at that point, they said, we're going to switch uh, to certifications and certification shift the onus of preparation onto the participants. The change from passive briefs to active certification changed the crew's behavior. We found yeah. that people knew they will be asked questions. They studied their responsibilities ahead of time. Dude, that's a good word. That I think, I, how many meetings have we been in where uh, it's just a formality and the guy who's in charge is talking and we're all like, nobody's listening to this. It's just about this guy listening to himself talk. Um, but when the shift is like, we know that we're going to have to participate and share something and 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 even be able to repeat back what's been trained to us we're on cue, we're ready. And just how that, how critical that is to leadership development. I'm actually going to be applying those same principles in our business where I'm in the process of completely revamping the pay structure um, of how I'm going to be putting pay structures into place, even for probably frontline workers to that concept, Mark, where I'm going to be saying, um, if you are certified in these things and you can tell me how to do it and you have the ability to show me that you're competent and confident in doing it, then you'll get paid for it. If you don't know it and you don't do it and you make mistakes on it, you're not going to get paid for it. In other words, your pay is going to be based upon your understanding, your competencies, your skill sets. Um, so I'm actually, it's going to take me a little while, but I'm actually in the process of putting modules together. That's that same thing where it's going to be like, okay, I come to the employee and I ask them, how do you do this? And if they show me that I'm like done, skill, skill, still accomplished, you're set, right? I can entrust that to you. And now I don't need you to ask me about it. I know I can trust you with it, but um, that also has some leverage to it, right? Because there's <laughs> uh, some pay that are attached to it. I keep going back to that same concept of how do we create that same environment in a highly volunteer, total 
um, relationship-based covenant network. Does that make sense? Like, how do you create that environment where people will go, yeah, I want to have the skill set so that I come to the table prepared and accountable and ready. It does make sense. And it, and it says that on our end, if we want to, if we want to create that, it's going to require some preparation and some work so that those leaders can rise up. I think sometimes it's like as, as leaders, if it's become intuitive for us and we just show up and we just expect people to step up, we're not going to raise up leaders. So it requires mm-hmm. us to anticipate and prepare and, and prepare them so that they're set up for success and they can actually begin to take ownership. So we've got to start as part of us, like, like what you're saying, Dave, is like you're taking ownership of that environment. I'm going to start to to put in place these things so that they can take ownership. Mm. I think I find that one of the hardest things to get across to somebody is that, yes, I do trust you to do this. That when you do have somebody who has the resources and you have empowered them and then you they call you. And they say, hey, how do I do this? Well, have you checked this information location? Yes. What information did you find that X needs to take place? Certain next step needs to take place. Okay, why are you calling me? Do you know how to do it? Do you know how to take care of it? Is there anything that I've done that has told you that you can't take care of that? And their answer is like, well, no. Okay, so you know what needs to be taken care of. You know how to take care of it. And you have the resources to take care of it why aren't you taking care of it? And their answer is always, well, I just wasn't sure if I could or not. They're like, that's not my problem. That's their problem. And so um, it's like we're wrestling against an entire culture that says be a follower, right? The whole premise of this book is something that we as leaders have to constantly wrestle against in order to create an environment that has this because everything is pushing against it. Going back to that word emancipation, this is what he says in the book. Emancipation is fundamentally different from empowerment. With emancipation, we are recognizing the inherent the inherent genius, energy, and creativity in all people and then allowing those talents to emerge. So, man, I love that. I love that language. And that's exactly what you're saying. You know, we've got to gotta release it. I think it's also significant how we, as those who maybe maybe emancipating when you do emancipate and let something go and release the control to the front lines when there is failure how we respond because if we berate somebody or do something that makes them feel um wow i messed up i i really don't have the free even though they gave me the control and the freedom i messed up and so that may even be why they come back again even though it's been released is they're like you know, I messed up last time you got, you jumped down my throat. Like, are you sure I can do this? Or, you know, I just want to double check that I'm doing this the right way because I, you know, I've seen that happen a lot too. Something gets released to somebody, they do it, but they don't do it the way in which the leader thought they should do it. And then they get jumped all over. And so I think that's a real key, you know, thing for a leader to be like, well, when they fail, there needs to be some type of encouragement and then instruction, you know, but uh, maybe clarification on on the standard of what you are expecting them to do, but but not like a berating or degrading of the person. Uh, I think it's just another, you know, resource, another principal resource. I mean, all of our all of our principles come from the Bible, right? That's where we get all of our information that we need to, to see the Great Commission accomplished. Um, but this is just another uh, outside resource that just, I think, reinforces everything that we're doing, these biblical principles, and we can learn we can learn from it as leaders. And uh, I suggest you go get it. There's lots of great books out there that also speak to this. Uh, Starfish and the Spider, Team of Teams. Uh, those are all great books that um, kind of overlap with some of these principles. Thanks for listening, for watching. If this content has been helpful for you, please take a minute to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. It really helps us to get this content out there farther to serve Jesus, grow his kingdom, and accomplish the Great Commission until there is no place left. Much love to you guys. See you next time.